Isn't really the question, if God is good, how could this have happened? If God is good, how can this have happened? How can one believe in value? One of the fundamental Jewish teaching is not just about God, it's that every human being has infinite value. That's the implication of human being being in the image of God. Now here you have the notion of infinite value of every human being. In the course of the Holocaust, they not only killed Jews en masse, but they tried to bring down the cost of killing Jews. It was a systematic policy, and, and came across this testimony in the Nuremberg trials, which just, it was one of those things, again, it finishes you off, you, in which this woman testified that they, to save the money, it cost them to gas children, they were gassing children, as, as women and men, they began to, they were given orders to throw the children directly into the pits, or into the burning pits, into the crematory, without gassing them first. And when the prosecutor asked her why they do this, she said, well, they were told they have to save money. Now, I was so devastated by that that I researched it. I couldn't believe it, first of all. And then when I checked it out, it turned out not only would they keep track, but that in 1944, when this had happened, they had figured out they could save money by cutting the gas supply in half so that by extending the agony of the victims, they could save money. And I, I checked the bills. The bills are there. The Nazis keep good records. And it turned out that you could estimate roughly that it cost them about $6.75 for a chamber load of gas. That is to say, they could gas about 1,500 people for less than $10, or roughly half a penny per person. And they had to save money. And they saved that half a cent by not doing that. Now, how can one go on speaking of God or the value of human life in that kind of a world? And, and again, I, so the honest answer is at first I was shattered. And why did I go on with faith? I don't know. Part of it, I think, was because I felt not to betray them. They had died because of this faith. Part of it was, and it sounds paradoxical to say it, after a while I began to have, after the anger and after the rage, I began to feel a certain pity for God and a certain compassion that God was suffering. And, and what a world this was that not only humans suffer this way, but God suffers. I think that was the first step towards some form of reconciliation. I think the other thing that kept me going, I mean, I was, and this again, where life comes from out of death in a sense, this, our first child was born, my wife and I, we, had, we were in Israel for the first time in our lives, an extended period. I can't, it was like, I was sitting all day and reading in Yad Vashem, it was cold, it was bitter, it was bitter inside, the soul was worse than the physical thing, and I would come home and there was this little baby, three month old, five month old baby, you know, growing and crying and running and not running. A resurrection of life? It was, or I'd come out of Yad Vashem and you would see in Jerusalem, it was pulsating with life. And, and there were, again, one of the great, this happened 15 years later, but it's the same experience as one. I came back in 74 to do a year's research on the Holocaust. The first year I was supposed to be teaching American history. The second year I came back, by then my life had changed and I knew I wanted to work in this area. And again, I remember one reading the climax of the Einsatzgruppen trials, which were the worst trials of all because this was the shooting squads. And, and you have to understand that people to shoot women and children mainly for months, a year, year and a half at a time, the brutalization and the cruelty and the viciousness and the boredom, that was the worst, the boredom that leads to more cruelty. When women don't fight back, you're bored, so you look for entertainment and killing you know, and things of that sort. I still remember one of these days when I came out, I was sort of literally chilled. I didn't think I physically and spiritually, I thought I was like frozen. And coming out, and I swear, I was struck by the overwhelming sunlight and it was, I heard these children's voices. And at first I thought I'm hallucinating. It was, the children were laughing and the children, were, it's as if the children had come to life. And of course, I stumbled toward the sound, toward the light, because I was blinded from the whole experience, and I looked down, and I realized that it wasn't hallucinating at all. Yad Vashem is built right over a valley, and in Jerusalem, this was Lagwa Omer day. This is a day when the children of the schools go out by the hundreds and the thousands, and they play, and they laugh, and they run around like little kids run around. I think what overwhelmed me was, first of all, this feeling that, my God, the power of life, and then I say again, it, it, in 61 too, how could I not believe? And when you experience the incredible force of life, and that's why I started some of my book, The Triumph of Life, it deals with this paradox of religion. I think the biblical religions, Judaism teaches that you would think that death wins. You, after all, we all die. You'd think that disorder wins. 
But it's not so. There is this hidden field force, which we call God, an infinite source of life and goodness that sustains and nurtures, and therefore the deeper truth, uh, not to take away from it from death, and not to take away that there are days when the death comes back and blocks my vision and blocks my faith. But the real truth, the deeper truth, is that life has been growing and has been overcoming death. That, that seems to me is the heart of it the It just claim. keeps on. It keeps on, and it's not an accident. First, it was rooted in this infinite source of life. And then the other thing I came to discover, I said this infinite consciousness that shares this pain, rooted in love, wants life, delights in life, and I'm sustains life. I'm fascinated by the idea of having compassion for God. I mean, the human response of, of having compassion, explain that. Well, Ken, I think most of us were raised with these images of the all-powerful, omnipotent God. You know, I, I've come to affirm, by the way, I think that is a correct image. I like to think of it as the image of the first stage of the divine relationship to the human. I've come to feel there are two core elements in Judaism and Jewish faith. One is this triumph of life belief, this affirmation that we are plugged into this infinite source of life and it's going to grow and it's going to complete quantitatively and qualitatively perfect itself in the world. The other main truth, I think, is what I call covenant or the process of perfecting the world. The world is not perfect. Now, the world is ugly and evil and has many elements of cruelty and viciousness. But Judaism teaches that there is this partnership between the divine and the human, not just with Jews, with all of humanity.